when Katya asked me if I would like to talk about uh, Jewish Jews of the Eclipse, I said to myself, uh, well, of course not. <laughs> I know nothing about it. Then I reminded myself of something that E.E. E. Cummings said in his autobiography, one of my favorite books in the world, when he was invited to give, I believe, the Norton Lectures at Harvard in 1950. And when he was asked to g give this talk, he said, but I, I uh, give it on poetry. I don't know anything to say about it. And then it occurred to him that he should say yes, because being asked to talk on something is an opportunity to learn. So I have gone from, on a scale of 1 to 10, zero knowledge to 0.12 <laughs> knowledge. Uh, but it has been a nice adventure for me to, to explore this. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, know more about this topic than I do. Uh, I'm going to talk with authority, <laughs> recognizing that I have none. <laughs> and I will welcome either in the Q&A section of this, uh, this event or at other times later or tomorrow or next week, uh, if, if I've said something preposterous, that I don't want to know. <laughs> but if I've said something that has some surface plausibility, but not very much depth plausibility, I'd like to hear from you about it, because uh, I do want to know, and it's a, it's a fascinating topic, and I'm going to try to explore a bit about the science of uh, eclipses, and then something about Jewish views on the eclipse. And who knew that uh, the Jewish tradition had a view on the eclipse? We do know, uh, and I don't need to repeat it to this group, that uh, Judaism has something to say on just about everything, <laughs> including what? Baseball. <laughs> That's it for an, an, a talk for another day. Okay, so as Katya pointed out, um, there's a, a growing uh, interest and enthusiasm as we anticipate the uh, called the Great American Eclipse on uh, April 8th of this year. Uh, the total solar eclipse will turn day into night across a swath of North America from Mexico in the southwest to Canada in the northeast. Now I want to say something about Judaism and astronomy. Judaism, the Jewish tradition, has always been interested in astronomy for a variety of really compelling reasons. First of all, there is a need for understanding the movements of the heavenly bodies, especially the sun and the moon, for determining events of the Jewish calendar and for navigation on the seas. Uh, how to determine leap years, uh, how to intercalate the calendar, adding and subtracting days, requires not only out of the, uh, some curiosity, but in order to engage in Jewish life in an authentic way, understanding what's going on in the heavens, I'm calling the hev it the heavens, is required. Also, looking up to the sky and noticing the sun, the moon, and the stars has always served as an arena for acknowledging and celebrating the grandeur of God's creation. So, for example, we have in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky proclaims his handiwork. You remember, may remember in the story of Abraham uh, that uh, at a certain point, Abraham, having received the promise from God that your progeny shall be as numerous as the stars of the sky, recognizes uh, when he turns 90, when he turns 100, and Sarah is 90, and they haven't had the first child, he turns to God and he says, uh, I don't know exactly in these words, what's up? <laughs> 
here I am of this age and you promised the uh, great uh, progeny and there's not a, a child one yet. And so the Torah says that God takes him outside and has him look up to the stars and the vastness of the uh, heavenly universe as if to suggest, look, if I could do this, I can certainly give Sarah a child at the age of 90. So that looking up to the heavenly bodies has also served as a way of glorifying the God who created the universe. Also, to look into the uh, heavenly bodies and to see the predictability of their movements. And I remember when I was a child, um, I would, as I was uh, trying to go to sleep, looking out my window up at the sky, and I saw the Big Dipper, I think. And uh, I did this over a period of some years, and lo and behold, every single year the Big Dipper was there. The predictability of the movement of the sun and the stars and the moons gives us a sense about the order of the universe. And of course, by contrast, when that order seems to be violated and some unexpected event happens, we tremble. At least the ancients trembled because this suggested perhaps that underlying an apparent order is a more durable kind of chaos. So unpredicted events or unanticipated creates the converse of a sense of security and creates or underlines our sense of insecurity. Uh, as an aside, the Jewish tradition has also been represented in the naming of certain elements in the skies. So for example, three craters of the moon are named for Jewish worthies. The crater with a name I didn't know until three days ago that craters of the moon were named. And lo and behold, they, they are. The crater known as Zagut is named for a famous rabbi, Abraham Zakuto, whose astronomical charts were used by Christopher Columbus. The crater known as Rabbi Levi is named after another famous rabbi. Rabbi Levi Gersom, Gershom, known as Gersonides, a biblical commentator, a philosopher, and of all things, an astronomer. The creator with the name Aban Ezra is named after the formidable commentator, Abraham Ibn Ezra, a grammarian and a philosopher and a commentator. So Jewish worthies find their place even as names of heavenly bodies. An interesting historical note that a predictable total solar eclipse on May 29th, 1919, provided an opportunity to prove, of all things, Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Relativity, that theory itself, posited that light could be bent by the gravitational pull of a heavenly body, for example, the sun. In order to try to demonstrate the truth of Einstein's theory, a man named Sir Arthur Eddington on an expedition during this eclipse showed that the amount of, deser of, of discerned deflection of light close to the sun was just what Einstein predicted. And in a famous paper describing the event, Eddington and two other scientists concluded, thus the results of our expeditions and scientific experiments during the eclipse can leave little doubt 
that a deflection of light takes place in the neighborhood of the sun and that this is the amount predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity as attributed to the sun's gravitational field. And as you might know, uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity deals with the relationship among time and space, mass and energy. His generalized theory introduces the notion of gravitation into the calculation. So the eclipse has served prominently as a way to uh, affirm or at least to add considerable evidence for this particular theory, and that's quite extraordinary. Einstein, with pen and pencil on a blackboard, predicted it, and lo and behold, the observable universe confirmed it, or at least showed that Einstein, what Einstein said was, uh, was true to a significant degree. So let's, let's uh, talk about a few technical terms, some of which, of course, you know. An eclipse represents a partial or total blocking of light of one celestial body by another. An eclipse of the sun or of the moon occurs when the earth, the sun, and the moon are aligned. What's a lunar eclipse? A lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth comes between the Sun and the Moon, blocking some of the light of the Moon and therefore casting a shadow on the Moon itself, the Earth in between, the Sun's light blocking the uh, light on the Moon. A solar eclipse occurs when the Moon comes between the Sun and the Earth, blocking some of the sunlight casting a shadow on the earth and creating different degrees of darkness. This darkness, this shadow, consists of two parts. The first part is called the umbra, in which no direct sunlight penetrates. Complete or near complete darkness. In the, in the area of, uh, of that uh, eclipse. The eclipse in the umbra is total. A penumbra, a penumbra is that area in which light is partially uh, appears from part of the sun's disk. And so a penumbral eclipse, or the area of the penumbra, is partial. The idea of totality, and I think Katya actually used the term totality, happens when the moon passes between the sun and the earth and completely blocks the face of the sun. People viewing the eclipse from locations where the moon's shadow completely covers the, is complete, exist in what we call the path of totality. And in the path of totality, which is narrow, 90 miles uh, at most, is to experience a total solar eclipse. So totality in any particular solar eclipse can be seen only in this narrow belt on the Earth. And as I just said, sometimes no more than 90 miles wide. Of course, some of the eclipse uh, can be seen anywhere in the 48, uh, lower 48 states of the United States. What about the idea of first contact? First contact occurs the moment when the disk of the moon, invisible during the day, in the brightness of the light of the, of the day, first touches the disk of the sun. So let's suggest this is the sun, you guys are the earth, as the moon moves, and we don't see the moon, but we begin to see the, light, the, 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 the circle, the disk of the sun, 
uh, becoming smaller as the moon moves in, and the beginnings of that uh, obser ob observation of diminishment of the sun's circle is the first contact. And we have the idea of partial phase. And the partial phase of the eclipse begins with when the small indentation of the sun becomes noticeable and the partial increases as the moon is moving into the path of the sun, or at least the direction of the sun. Toward the beginning of totality, the direct light from the sun will diminish very quickly. The sky will become dark in the middle of the day. The air will become noticeably cooler. Shadows will become sharper. Stars will come out. Animals will re react with apparent fear. Pets may express confusion. Bees will stop buzzing. Birds will become confused and start chirping their nighttime songs. And most interestingly, I think, people will often feel a sense of either dread, fear, or awe, A-W-E. And we can imagine the ancients who didn't have our science would have felt dread most of all as if some cataclysm, some catastrophe, was about to occur. In sum, this magnificent spectacle, spectacle during which the moon passes between the sun and the earth, completely blocking the sun, will occur, as Katya said, and as we know, on April 8th of this year. On that day, a narrow pathway, the path of totality from Mexico to Canada, will display a total eclipse for several minutes when the moon and the sun are perfectly aligned. So the question might be asked, how can a body like the moon, which is much, much smaller than the sun, be able to cast a complete shadow in parts of the Earth completely blocking out the sun. How can a small body do that? And the answer is, and I certainly don't know the science about it, that the sun needs to be at the, as great a distance as is possible to make the sun as it recedes be, look and become, in terms of the light, smaller and smaller. So if the moon is hundreds of times smaller than the sun, the sun needs to be hundreds of times more, more distant from the sun in order for that small object, the moon, to block out the sun entirely. By many measures, the April event will, I'm quoting, and so the author at this point says, please pardon the, the pun. I'm going to start it again. By many measures, April's event will eclipse the last total solar eclipse that passed over the United States in 2017. And there are three reasons, or a couple of reasons, why the eclipse now will eclipse the importance of the 2017. First of all, the shadow of totality will be twice as wide as that of the 2017 eclipse, so it will be easier to find a place in which to view it in any given state of the pathway. Secondly, the time of totality will be almost twice as long as uh, indeed over four minutes in many locations. Even if people can't get into the path of totality, as I said a few minutes ago, it's possible to observe partial eclipses in a variety of other areas. Cities across the United States, including Dallas, Indiana, Indianapolis, and Cleveland, will experience 
the path of totality. And that's why so many people are going to be rushing to these places. <laughs> One might say, why not view it in Oklahoma or in Oregon? And in fact, you can see part of the, a partial eclipse there, but you can't see totality unless you're in that path. Um, the eclipse here in Cleveland will begin at 1.59 in the afternoon and end completely at 4.29. That is from the beginning to the very, very end. And the totality here will take place over 3 minutes and 50 seconds from 3.13 in the afternoon and some seconds to 3.17 in the afternoon. Now, what about predicting an eclipse? So what is interesting, and I had no idea that this was the case, that Thales, now Thales was a pre-Socratic pre philosopher. We think of Thales as the first philosopher in the Western tradition. And an interesting, undoubtedly apocryphal story has arisen about Thales in order to try to puncture the aspirations of philosophy. The philosophers, and I'm really sorry to report this, sometimes experience denigration and ridicule. Can you imagine that? But Thales is alleged to be so caught up in looking at the heavens in order to speculate about things that he fell into a pit. And this is the way philosophers sometimes respond. Thales himself is acclaimed to have predicted an eclipse of the sun which occurred on May 28, 585 before the Common Era. Okay. Socrates died in 399. That's almost 200 years before Socrates. The earliest extant account of the eclipse comes from the great Greek historian Herodotus, known as the father of history, who says the following. On one occasion, the Medes and the Lydians had an unexpected battle in the dark an event which occurred after five years of indecisive warfare. The two armies had already engaged and the fight was in progress when day, this is Herodotus, when day suddenly turned into night. This change from darkness, from daylight to darkness, had been foretold by Thales, who fixed the date within the limits in which it took place. Those soldiers were terrified. The battle became inconclusive, and they went on with their activities. Modern science confirms that that eclipse was total. And according to Herodotus, the umbra of the eclipse of Thales must have passed over the battlefield. Now, interestingly, some commentators have suggested that Thales predicted the solar eclipse of 585 BCE through a knowledge of what is known as the Saros period, S-A-R-O-S, -S, the knowledge of which goes back to ancient Mesopotamia. The Saros period, up to two days ago, I'd never heard of the Saros period, the Saros period is a cycle of 223 months, which is 18 years and 10 days, after which eclipses of both the sun and the moon repeat themselves with very little change. So in other words, there is this cycle, which now I suppose is a commonplace to astronomers, that every 18 years and 10 days, you are going to repeat just what happened below those many years ago. And so one can predict, evidently, both past, that would be retrodiction, and prediction of subsequent um, eclipses.
very, very interesting. I didn't realize, maybe you didn't either, that there seemed to be cycles, recurring cycles of these phenomena. Human beings have been predicting solar and lunar eclipses for almost 2,000 years, in other words, long before they knew why it was happening or what made it meaningful. These days, we have a pretty good understanding of when they will take place. NASA has plotted every single eclipse for the next 1,000 years, and for every eclipse that did occur in the past 4,000 years. So with some of that interesting information in, in mind, I want to now turn to um, some Jewish views of this phenomenon. So the time at which the moon is directly between the sun and the earth is also the start of every Jewish month. And so a lunar, a solar eclipse can occur only at or very close to Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of each Jewish month so that uh, that occurs when the dark side of the moon is facing the earth. And so it has to be a new moon. However, we don't witness a solar eclipse, of course, on every Rosh Chodesh. And this bec is because the moon's orbit doesn't just follow a path of, a to of totality, but will be off by several degrees. And so the visibility or the notion of an eclipse. Now, there will be an eclipse because the sun and the moon are always aligned at this uh, time in some way or another, but that pathway may go out into the sea. We may not even know that it's, that it's happening. One commentator makes the following claim. While the Jewish tradition has long been ex the accepting basic scientific explanations for the rules of the cosmos, this has not stopped Jewish sages over the centuries from looking at the eclipse as a series of portents or signs reflecting the magic and the mystery of the heavens. So what we do have here is a combination of a recognition by the Jewish tradition of the importance of science and the predictability of certain phenomena, but that doesn't mean that these phenomena are observed or received only as what we might call objective facts, but the, the meaning of these things has stimulated other concerns by our commentators. So, for example, at the very beginning of the Bible, in chapter one of Genesis, the creation story, uh, has been seen as reflecting the occurrence of eclipses and their spiritual meanings. So let's take chapter one, verse 14. God said, let there be luminaries in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day and the night, and they shall serve as signs and for seasons. Signs and for seasons. So, one commentator, uh, Nachum Sarna, contemporary commentator, takes this, these two words, X and Y, as Y modified by X. So that at the beginning of Genesis, we have, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, formless and void, uh, tohu vavohu, which is often translated a formless void, okay? known by the technical term hendiatus. So according to Sarna, this should be translated not uh, signs and seasons, but set times for seasons. In other words, for Sarna, the notion of signs shouldn't be taken as having significant meaning 
because all it means is set times for the seasons. But Rashi in the 12th century says, interprets this signs and seasons as the times when the lights are stricken, when the lights are problematic. And he uses the Hebrew term for eclipses. So the times when the lights are stricken are, as Rashi understands it, the times of eclipses. When, he goes on to say, solar and lunar eclipses occur. And he goes on to say, it is a bad omen, Siman Rahu. It is a bad omen for the world. So already, uh, perhaps the most important commentator in the history of Judaism understands Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 as alluding to ellip uh, eclipses and noting their meaning. That they are bad signs for whom? For Rashi, for the world. And he makes a distinction here between the world and the Jewish world because he goes on to say, when you perform the will of God, you don't need to worry about the consequences of eclipses. And the consequences of eclipses are punishments or possible punishments for our misdeeds. So already Rashi is understanding the phenomenon of an eclipse in a variety of ways. Yes, following the laws of astronomy and the laws of science. But as the Bible points out, they are signs. Signs point to meanings. And the meanings suggest something negative about an assessment of human activity. Okay? So the heavenly bodies are, in, this, in these terms, being read for meaning. Um, as I pointed out, the Hebrew word for eclipse is the word likui, which means defect, defect. So the Hebrew word points out that there's something aberrational about the phenomenon of an eclipse. And the Talmud, citing Rashi, states that an eclipse, a likui of the sun, is a bad sign for those of us on earth. And the Talmud goes on with a parable. And here's the parable. To what is this matter to be compared? It is comparable to a king of flesh and blood who prepared a feast for his servants and placed a lantern before them to illuminate the hall. Okay, you get the parable. The lantern is parallel to the sun, okay? And the king is, uh, is comparable to God. So let me go back to the beginning. It is comparable to a king, which king? Of flesh and blood, who prepared a feast for his servants and placed a lantern before them to illuminate the hall, to bring light to the hall. And of course, it's an easy transition from light to enlightenment, to shed light on a situation. So the sun, like the lantern, is a gift. And just as the lantern brings light in a dark room, so does the sun bring enlightenment in a potentially or actually dark world. But the parable goes on to say, the king became angry at the people and said to his servant, take the lantern from them and seat them in darkness. Okay. Many commentators of the Talmud find this comment perplexing. Since an eclipse is a natural and predictable phenomenon, 
How could it be a bad omen or an indication of sin as the Talmud seems to suggest? One scholar concludes that the Talmud is not referring to an eclipse, but rather the phrase in the Talmud, eclipse of the sun, means nothing more than blemish or an affliction in the sun, okay? So likui as a defect is no longer to be seen as a defect transmitted by that eclipse in terms of significance to the earth that something uh, defective is going on here. But according to this interpretation, the defect is in the sun and therefore has only physical meaning and not moral and spiritual implications. You see how this can, uh, can complicate the matter? Most commentators, though it's an attractive approach, to return the issue merely to the science of eclipses and not to the moral and spiritual implications. But most commentators evidently reject this approach and understand the Talmud as referring to an, a solar eclipse, which by definition affects us on Earth. If it's merely a defect in the sun, then it wouldn't have eclipse connotations. But most interpreters suggest that what this means is an eclipse with all of its moral and spiritual implications. If so, how do these commentators explain the idea that a natural and predictable phenomenon is somehow a bad omen? It's an interesting question. We have to note uh, that the Talmud doesn't seem to see the negativity of the omen as a prediction of a disaster, that something bad will happen. It is, the Talmud seems to suggest, a sign of sin, not of punishment. And the difference between sin and punishment for our purposes is the prediction of a punishment seems to be certain. If you predict a punishment, the punishment will happen. If it refers to sin, we know that in our tradition at least, sins can be atoned for by repentance. So what would be drastic is to think that eclipses predict an inevitable disaster. But if it's a way of pointing to sinfulness, then there is a way back. So that in this interpretation, the meaning of an eclipse is that it's a warning. It's not a prediction, but a warning that can engender acts of atonement, of a plea for forgiveness, and a resolve to do better in the future. And as we know, repentance can wipe the slate clean. So that in this sense, an eclipse is, in its meaning, a gift from God in order to draw our attention to our waywardness so it doesn't continue to get us into trouble and that we can find a way back. An eclipse points to a defect for which there is reversibility. And in fact, we could note, as the Talmud does, that even at totality, that is, when the moon blocks the sun entirely in the path of totality, even in totality, there is a penumbra of light around the moon, rays of light that come out from around the darkness of the moon, which can and have been interpreted as rays of hope. In other words, in the reality of darkness, 
which might be understood as pointing to our sinfulness and our waywardness, there is still some light coming from the source of the darkness, the moon, which points to, in the arena of darkness, that there is still always hope that God is with us, even in the darkness. And just as a digression from what I know about the Kabbalah on this issue, the Kabbalists point out that even in a total eclipse, the sun is still shining. Nothing has happened to the sun. And so that even in the darkest times of our lives, the light, the nourishing light of the sun still exists. Or as we might say about the human soul, uh, you may remember from the prayers early in the uh, uh, Shabbat and holiday morning, the soul, the soul what you have given me is pure. Thou hast created, thou hast formed it, thou hast placed it within me. The soul, here's the analogy to the sun, the sun is still shining even when it's obscured. The soul is still pure even which through our actions we create some impurities in our lives. And the fact that our sins, let's say, do not obliterate or alter the pure nature of the soul, the fact that we have gone astray does not compromise the idea that our souls remain pure and therefore can lead us in right paths as well. Uh, and the rabbis point to three sections of the Bible in order to suggest that the eclipse is an ongoing phenomenon even in biblical history. You may remember in Joshua chapter 11, God makes the sun stand still. Uh, that is seen by some commentators as a sign of an eclipse. Amos, the prophet Amos chapter 8, I'm going to quote, I, this is God, Amos quoting God, I will make the sun set at noon and darken the earth on a day of light. Okay? Metaphor. Hmm. Why not interpret it uh, literally. I mean, uh, let, let, me, let me say that again. We could certainly see this as metaphorical, but we can understand why some might want to in, interpret it literally and therefore point to the awareness of e the eclipse, even in the ancient world, and its moral and spiritual aspects. Let's ask the question of whether or not we should uh, say a blessing when we see an eclipse. First of all, though, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson, is said to have uh, to, met, to state that eclipses are meant to be opportunities for increasing prayer and introspection. And another famous medieval rabbi says the following, that the phenomenon is natural. This is a bow to science. The phenomenon is natural, but the Talmud is explaining the reason of the reason. The reason there are eclipses is to be found in science. The reason for the reason is to be found in spirituality matters. Uh, this rabbi explains that light symbolizes reality and existence, and darkness symbolizes chaos and illusion. Because God gave humanity freedom of the will, God knew that sin was inevitable and that people would often choose chaos over order illusion over reality. And so, according to this line of reasoning, God recognizing 
the universal aspects of human nature, created a system that would remind us regularly that our choices can create darkness, but that can also bring back the light. Now, this is a very interesting idea. The rabbis asked the following question, which may never have occurred to any of you. I know it never occurred to me. What was happening before the creation of the world? What kind of a question is this? Creation is the beginning. But the rabbis are wondering what was done before. And this is tantamount to asking, before God, like a builder, builds the house, what does the builder need to do to create the conditions for the building of the house? In other words, what happened before creation were the conditions for the possibility of sustaining creation. And one of the things that was created before creation was the grave of Moses, which in itself is very interesting. That already there was the idea that there will come a great leader and there will need to be a, a, a burial, and here it is. Another thing created before creation was repentance. In other words, repentance was created as the antidote to the disease that was bound to recur. In other words, before human beings began to sin, God had already created the way back. God created the cure before God created the disease. How about that? Already when human beings came into existence, there was an understanding that we would go astray. And would we be up a creek without a paddle when we go astray? No. The paddle was created before human beings were created to sin. Okay? Just as God created the possibilities of an eclipse, knowing that we human beings would sin, and we might sin unknowingly or be afraid to face the fact of our waywardness, and so we needed warnings, we needed signals. Something has gone wrong. Will you pay attention and try to mend your ways? Say you're sorry and try to do better the next time. And unless there were signals given to us, we might never recognize that we are creating disease in our souls, in our personae. And so these eclipses were created before creation in order to serve as warnings to us so that we take notice that we have work to do. Don't you find this fascinating? All the speculations about the meaning of a natural scientific phenomenon, and if you know the Cero cycle, you know that it's all predictable. And therefore, why do I need anything else? And yet the rabbis, as all traditions, try to humanize the realities of our situation and give us ways to make choices within the confines of the structure of things. So, so let's think about the question of, um, of uh, what's, shall we say, a blessing over an eclipse. Now, the rabbis in the Mishnah, especially in the tractate brachot, brachot means blessings, point out that we should say a blessing when we see a rainbow, when we see a great ocean, when we see uh, uh, the sun come up in the morning, that we should pay attention to the phenomena around us which give our world its beauty and its power and not allow these things to happen without acknowledgement. So natural phenomena, especially rare ones, rainbows for example, ought to be acknowledged by saying Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech 
Should a comparable rare phenomenon, an eclipse, be accompanied by a blessing? What a nice question. It's not the most burning question of all, but it is an interesting question. And here's one meditation on that question. Even for bad tidings, bad tidings, one recites a special blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam dayan ha'emet. Praised are you, Lord, our God, sovereign of the universe, the righteous judge. Every time I begin to conduct a funeral, I gather the mourners and I have them recite this prayer after me. An acknowledgement of certain things, even when the news is bad. The Mishnah articulates the following principle. One is obligated to recite a blessing for the bad that befalls them, just as we recite a blessing for the good that befalls us. As it is stated, here's a quote uh, from the Via Hafta, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Now, interestingly, the word heart can be spelled in two ways. Lamed vav, la, lev, or lamed vav, vav. Two letters, vav. Hmm? Lavav. Why does the via hafta spell heart with two vavs and not with one? The Mishnah explains this as follows. You, you get the point that this is something which might arouse curiosity. There are two ways of spelling it. Why did the, why did the author choose the second way? There are two possible answers to this question. For no reason at all, don't make a big deal out of a choice. He got up one morning, he had cereal, it was bothering him. He spelled it with two vavs and not with vav. This is the end of the matter. Why are you making a deal out of this? This is to forget a fundamental axiom of rabbinic Judaism that the Torah never says anything by accident. Everything has meaning. This is the idea of pan-significance. Everything has meaning. Thousands of years before Sigmund Freud. Freud said, you know, mistakes, jokes, they all have psychological meaning. This axiom suggests that there are no accidents, that two vavs are there deliberately. Because with all your heart, this uh, passage goes on to say, means with your two inclinations. You shall love the Lord your God with your yetzer hatov, with your good inclination, and your yetzer hara the evil inclination. Both should be ways of loving God. With all your soul means even if God takes your soul. And so this is a text which tries to show that we should acknowledge reality and say a blessing even when something untoward or problematic happens to us. And it raises a nice question for us. Why do we say, praise are you, Lord our God, uh, the righteous judge, when our loved one has been taken from us? And here's an oversimplified suggestion to put off despair. When we lose a loved one, especially uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a difficult, we might say unnatural, a premature, a grotesque way, we're likely to despair. We're likely to say why, why life is not worth things and we can't afford to do that. So we praise God not knowing why it has happened for giving us the life that God gave us, even for bad things. So this suggests that if one accepts the omen view of an eclipse, 
one should just as one says a prayer for seeing a rainbow or seeing a great body of water one should also say a blessing upon seeing an eclipse even if one is terrified by it see the logic there and it serves a fundamental need of human beings to maintain our buoyancy, to maintain our optimism, our will to continue. Blessings, as far as I'm concerned, fall into, in this regard, two categories. Because of blessings and in spite of blessings. Because of blessings. Thank you for all the wonderful things, because things are wonderful. In spite of blessings. In spite of the fact that I am deeply wounded by what is happening, nevertheless, to me that's the greatest word in the Jewish tradition, nevertheless. I will continue to praise God. And that's what the two vavs suggest here. The conservative movement often deals with these questions through its Committee on Jewish Law. And about the 2017 uh, eclipse, great interest was provoked for the committee. Lunar, lunar eclipses, of course, are more commonly experienced, but it's the solar eclipse that raises a question. And here's their response to the question. Our tradition suggests that we see each life experience as an opportunity to connect with God. While many texts may be invoked, the classic most intensive liturgical response is through saying a bracha, a blessing, invoking God's name. Such blessings are mandated of course, for the consumption of food, motzi, for the performance of many mitzvot. The ninth chapter of the tractate Barachot enumerates the text of many blessings to be said about seeing remarkable natural or human phenomena. We're to say a blessing when we see a great Jewish scholar. We're also to say a blessing when we see a great scholar from another tradition, to praise God for implanting wisdom among us. That's a pretty amazing gesture on the part of this tradition. The statement goes on to say, the, these examples include thunder and lightning, trees in new bloom, rainbows, extremely large crowds, and so on. A solar eclipse, they go on to say, when our view of the sun is blocked by the moon, certainly a unique natural event, which causes us to ponder our place in the universe. No, notice the move there from the meaning of the objective event and the meaning of the event for us. Right? I might say there are at least two different views of our place in the universe. It might be, let's put it in terms of theological terms, that the universe is theocentric, God-centered, and that we revolve at some remove around God. We can also see the universe as homeocentric, as revolving around us, the first chapter of Genesis reaches its culmination in the creation of human beings. Or when, when the uh, first chapter of Genesis talks about the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars shall be for signs and for seasons. Seasons for whom? For us. That the heavenly bodies are made for us. Even though Genesis 1 posits a theocentric universe, homeocentricity is a very important feature of the biblical story. God makes a covenant with us, with us human beings. When this passage says that 
an eclipse causes us to ponder. Now, it's, I want to say it says two things. The nature of the universe, but it says to ponder our place in the universe. This is to think about objective events as they affect us which is, when you think about it, a very, very putzbadika move that somehow the universe and its heavenly bodies, millions and trillions of miles away, somehow is centered around our needs. But the rabbis raise that question about what these objective phenomena mean to us. And they go on to say that and ask, is there an appropriate blessing formula to be recited for an eclipse? And the answer to this question may be of narrow interest on its own, applying to an only fairly rare event, but it also uh, provides an opportunity to understand the philosophical and practical process by which our understanding of our lives in Jewish terms is to be understood. So uh, I know time is running out and I want to have time for comments and questions. So let me, um, let me say something about Reform Judaism's view of this. So we've seen that the conservative movement is somewhat ambivalent about it. Should we say a blessing for something which has negative connotations or not? The Orthodox tend to see this phenomenon as either problematic enough that no blessing should be said, and the Lubavitcher rabbi, said, rabbi says no blessing should be said, or on the assumption of b'chol vavachad, two vavs, we should be saying a blessing for every phenomenon, positive or negative. So I want to point to a Reform Jewish view of this. And uh, you, you, you may be surprised at what I'm about to read here, given to what, what we've uh, just, uh, we just talked about. So some cultures, including some Jewish traditions, see the darkness caused by the eclipse as a bad omen. The moon, the sun, the stars are important to many cultures and eclipse sightings have been recorded for nearly 5,000 years. The Jewish calendar is lunar, which means the months and holidays are based on the cycles of the moon. Because the moon dictates the Jewish calendar, must the eclipse have a particular meaning for our community? Although, and the answer, of course, is yes, in terms of uh, working out the calendar. Although some traditions see the eclipse's darkness as a bad sign, are there other ways to view it? And at our institute, this author points out, whose unique focus explores the connection between Judaism and science and technology, we look at the eclipse as an opportunity to learn about our solar system and to ask new questions. For example, why do natural occurrences occur? What is the science that drives them? How can this information be connected to our Jewish teachings, values, and traditions? Understanding the scientific wonder that causes a phenomenon by perfectly aligning the earth, the moon, and the sun, we can see the eclipse as a gift, not as a warning, not as a bad omen. The minutes of unexpected darkness when the moon covers the sun can remind us of the importance and value of the sun in our daily lives. Privation leads us to appreciate when we've had it and when we hope to have it. This week, our natural world is telling us that beyond the darkness, there is light. Behind the dark circle of the moon, there is a warm, bright, shining light. Let us use the eclipse as an opportunity to ask questions about our Earth 
marvel at natural wonders, and appreciate the daily miracle of sunlight. A very, very different view. So we can see that our Jewish tradition, way back even from the author of the first chapter of Genesis, let alone the great scholars of the Middle Ages, and in modern times, the great movements of Judaism, each of those elements have, uh, has pondered the meaning of the eclipse for our lives without denying the importance and the power of the science of explanation. So what we're about to experience on April 8th has gone through the prism of exploration, explanation in a variety of ways. Uh, if we know things about our Jewish tradition, we know that there's always what the rabbis call a devar acher, another explanation. Let me give you an explanation. And after that, another rabbi says, yeah, but there's another way to look at it. A, a pluralism of interpretations. By the way, this points to a difference between, according to the Orthodox, the difference between halakha and agadah. Halakha, Jewish law, agadah, thought, lore, philosophy. For halakha, there can be no devar acher when an authentic rabbi makes a decision, that's the decision. Of course, good rabbis, if they don't really know the answer, are gonna ask their rabbi. I'll give you a very quick digression. Many, many years ago, I was co-officiating at a wedding out of town with an Orthodox rabbi, and we were in the rehearsal and we were at the point where we were talking about who's going to walk the bride down the aisle. And this was a, a, a family where uh, the, there was a mother and a father and a stepfather. And there had been a divorce, been father and mother. Who's walking down the aisle? And they turned to us and they said, rabbis, what should we do? The two rabbis had very different approaches to the answer to this question. I said, I don't remember what I said, but I came up with a, here's what I think we ought to do. The Orthodox rabbi said, I don't really know. Let's pause the rehearsal while I go into the rabbi's office here and I'll call my rabbi. <laughs> he called his rabbi and his rabbi said, you know what, I don't know. <laughs> Let me call my rabbi. That's right. So in that tradition, there are a, there's a hierarchy of rabbinic authorities. And the different traditions of Orthodox Judaism have different kinds of hierarchy. So that in terms of Jewish law, there is a right answer even if a particular Orthodox rabbi doesn't know it, and he will know that he doesn't know it, this is the employment of the good old Socratic idea of the importance of the knowledge of ignorance. We have to know that we don't know, and therefore we'll search for the answer. Uh, in terms of thought, in terms of interpretation of the text, there are many possible interpretations, and we have seen that here, the possibility of variety. And we revel in the variety, don't we? especially because it opens up possibility and meaning. I'm gonna stop with that and see if you have comments or questions.